Today's episode is sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. How do you feel about online shopping? Do you do it often? And how many times do you scour the internet looking for a promo code that works when it's time to check out? Well, thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Honey is the free shopping tool that finds promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. Imagine you're shopping on one of your favorite sites. When you check out, the Honey button appears, and all you have to do is click Apply Coupons and wait a few seconds as Honey searches for coupons it can find for that site. If Honey finds a working coupon, you'll watch the prices drop. And Honey doesn't just work on desktop, it works on your iPhone too. Just activate it on Safari, on your phone, and save on the go. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting the show. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash podcast. That's joinhoney.com slash podcast. Coming up. And she, in her video testimony, says he pointed the gun to his chest and accidentally pulled the trigger. But we don't know what she means by he. For Vault Studios, I'm Reed Redmond. You're listening to The Daily Crime. Well, tonight, a Lexington doctor is behind bars, charged in connection with a fatal shooting. He's 46-year-old Adam Lazzarini. In May of 2018, a South Carolina doctor was arrested and charged with involuntary manslaughter following the shooting death of 30-year-old William Holland. According to police, the two men had been at Lazzarini's home the previous fall, looking at Lazzarini's gun collection when Holland was shot in the chest. He died from a single gunshot wound at a home on Hunter's Mill Drive in Casey. In February of this year, Adam Lazzarini went on trial, and a jury was tasked with trying to piece together what exactly happened that night. The court heard a recording of the coroner speaking with Lazzarini the day of the shooting. In the tape, an emotional Lazzarini saying he was confused about what happened and that his friend may have accidentally shot himself. In the recording, the coroner questions Lazzarini's account, saying Holland's wound appeared to be from close contact and that the angle of the shot doesn't match up. Lazzarini repeatedly says he's confused and doesn't know exactly what happened. Becky Buds joins us from WLTX in Columbia, South Carolina. Becky, you recently covered the manslaughter trial of a South Carolina doctor named Adam Lazzarini. First off, who is Adam Lazzarini? What can you tell me about his life prior to this? So Adam Lazzarini is a prominent doctor. He's from, um, he was living in New York previously. Uh, There's a hospital here called Lexington Medical Center. They were looking to expand their orthopedic surgery department in the hospital. And so they kind of recruited him And he has a daughter, and he uh, moved here with his wife as well, who passed um, about in 2018 about. Let's go back to the alleged crime. What do we know about what happened on October 9th, 2017? So it all started with Lazzarini and a medical salesman, William Player Holland, along with another colleague of theirs, um, another sales rep in the medical field. They were about to fly over to uh, Columbus in Georgia, and they were going to go see a medical operation, um, something new that that has never been done before. And he was going to go watch it to be familiar with this procedure because they were looking to bring it over to Lexington Medical Center. So um, the sales, one of the sales rep has a private plane because he goes back and forth between Columbia and Georgia pretty often. And he's a pilot. So they were going to go fly over there. They actually did fly to Columbus and uh, the procedure was canceled. So they said, hey, why don't we just fly back home? Um, They had things to do. So they went back home and they went to go get lunch at a restaurant here in Columbia, Cantina 76, uh, down in downtown You know, they're sitting there for hours having drinks, uh, you know, margaritas, tequila. Um, They said it was about a three hour long lunch, very long, you know, just three guys talking a lot, you know, going back and forth in the biz. And um, then, you know, they had the conversation had come up about hunting and guns. William Player Holland was big into hunting. And then Adam Lazzarini was also kind of a gun buff, um, had a pretty 
big collection of guns. So they start talking about that. They decide, you know, hey, let's go check out this gun collection. So they actually had to go drop this out the pilot off back at the airport. He had to fly back to Columbus. So they drop him off at the airport and they head over to Lazzarini's home. And from there, it's not very clear what happens. It's the whole reason the trial went on. But basically, you know, his wife, uh, Lazzarini's wife was making dinner you know, they're having a few drinks while she's making dinner. And eventually they go upstairs to Lazzarini's bedroom where he keeps his collection of guns. And uh, allegedly they were playing around with about two different guns. Um, Lazzarini's attorney says that Lazzarini let Holland hold an unloaded 45 caliber pistol. And then Lazzarini unloaded a nine millimeter pistol also to show to Holland. Holland handed the nine millimeter gun back to Lazzarini and Lazzarini reloaded it and set the gun down back on the bed. Uh, Lazzarini's attorney says then Lazzarini left the room. And when he came back, Holland handed him over a gun, but first. And so that's when, during this exchange, Holland was shot. And so Lazzarini's attorney alleges that, you know, Lazzarini didn't know that this was the gun that was loaded because they were uh, exchanging two different guns. One was unloaded, the other was loaded. They basically say that but in this exchange, that is how uh, William Player Holland wound up dead. And it was uh, an accidental shooting. And Lazzarini's attorney stood by that the entire trial. There's obviously a lot to unpack here. Let's start with this. Do we know, was anyone else there to actually witness what happened? According to testimony, Lazzarini's five-year-old daughter was in the room when William Player Holland was shot. And originally, Lazzarini told investigators no one was in the room. He said he he told investigators he thought his daughter was on the bed, but it turns out she wasn't. That later was disproved. You know, there was a video testimony shown to jurors from his five-year-old daughter of her describing what she witnessed in the room that day. And then eventually, uh, Lazzarini did say that his daughter was in the room. But originally, he told investigators she was not. Do we know what else? I know there were some conflicting stories that he gave. Do you know what else... Lazzarini told investigators following this incident? Of course, there's a few different stories he told investigators. The first, when it, right after it happened, we heard a recording between the coroner and Lazzarini where Lazzarini says to her that he was not even in the room. His original story was Lazzarini was in the bathroom when the shooting happened and William Player Holland accidentally shot himself. And that was the first story he said. You know, days later, he then told them he it was the exchange of the gun. Um, he also told one of his friends that he had his back. He was in the room, but his back was facing Holland. So there, those were kind of the three main stories uh, he had told investigators. Again, this happened all the way back in October of 2017. At the time, Lazzarini wasn't charged. At what point did that change? Investigators ended up revisiting this case after his wife Vanessa Beery was found dead in their home. Investigators have also said that his wife, 43-year-old Vanessa Beery, was found dead in their Casey home earlier this week. Dr. Lazzarini is the one who reported her death. An investigation is still ongoing. She died from, um, it turns out, acute heartbeat from medical complications. And I guess they must have realized, hey, this is the same house we visited seven months ago for that accidental shooting, which they, they thought it was accidental at the time. And they realized he had, you know, several different stories. They realized he had been drinking that day. And so with those conclusions, they decided to serve him with an indictment on involuntary manslaughter charges. Um, and that all came after his wife, died and uh, about eight months later. Lazzarini was arrested in May of 2018 then. Finally, earlier this year, the case goes to trial. Take us through the trial first. What was the prosecution's argument? 
So prosecutors the whole time really kept repeating that term of criminally negligent. They said Lazzarini was criminally negligent with a firearm. They argued between drinking and the fact that Lazzarini was experienced with guns, that it seemed unlikely that he would be accidentally handling them wrong. I mean, this is a man, they argued he has, you know, concealed carry permits. And so it was just unlikely that he would just accidentally fire um, a gun uh, so negligently. And they they really came back to that criminally negligent that he had, and it was unintentional. They never argued that Lazzarini intentionally shot Holland, but they said he kind of disregarded basic safety procedures when handling a firearm. Um, So things like you should never drink while handling a firearm. You should never hand a gun back fully loaded, things like that. They kept pointing to that he was not mindful with this pistol and it resulted in the death of Holland. And again, the defense's explanation was that this was a mix-up of guns. Yes, yes. They stood by that the entire time and they really played to the point of reasonable doubt. They they really kept saying that over and over again to the jurors. And so they kept trying to poke holes in the prosecution's evidence that it's just not 100% provable uh, Lazzarini was um, criminally negligent. So yeah, they maintained it was accidental the entire time. Definitely tried to um, show jurors it's unclear who pulled the trigger. That was a key argument for them was, did Holland pull the trigger or was it Lazzarini? That was something they continuously tried to prove to jurors. You were in court for the trial. What moments, what pieces of witness testimony stand out to you looking back on it? I would say the video testimony from his daughter was quite... Interesting. In the video, Lazzarini's daughter, who was five at the time, says she was in the room with her dad and his friend who were looking at guns. She says her dad was holding a gun when he accidentally pulled the trigger, causing Holland to, quote, accidentally die. They had interviewed her eight, about eight months after it happened. And she, in her video testimony, says he pointed the gun to his chest and accidentally pulled the trigger. But we don't know what she means by he. She never says who he is. So even that was so interesting because it was kind of the first time that the jurors heard a possibility that the gun was pointed at someone's chest, assuming Holland's chest, and that the trigger was pulled. And it wasn't, it was kind of the first time jurors had that possibility that it wasn't a mix-up of guns. It wasn't a handing off of the shooting, of, of the gun that resulted in the shooting. And then his neighbors as well, who had, um, they were with him the days after the shooting. They said, Lazarini told them I think I shot my best friend. You know, maybe I shot him. I think I shot my best friend. And those were really powerful words. It was kind of, again, the first time jurors heard the possibility that Lazzarini was responsible for the shooting and it wasn't just an accident. Those really stand out to me as the biggest moments. Also, you know, interesting times when they had gun gun experts come up, you know, there was someone who they were, they had the guns, the guns used in the shooting, um, all of course, safely locked, but you could, for the first time, see, they kind of, reenacted what could have happened to jurors. And that was powerful because you get to see the angle of the gun, the way it would have been possibly handed off. And so to see it played out, I think gave jurors um, a more visual idea of what happened that day. The jury finally began its deliberations after a nine-day trial. How long did it take for them to reach a verdict? And what was the verdict that they reached? They were sent to deliberate at about 3.30. Uh, It was a long day of testimony. That was when we had closing statements. And so closing statements wrapped up at 3.30. Um, That was then they had to go to lunch. So I would say they probably deliberated from 4 o'clock to 8 o'clock. It took them four hours. And that was probably the most interesting day of the trial because they deliberated and then the judge comes out with a note from the jury and the note reads, 
we cannot come to a unanimous verdict. And so, so the judge asks the lawyers, what would you like me to do? They have her um, bring the jury back out and read them their duties as jurors, basically kind of encouraging them to keep deliberating. It was only about an hour and a half of deliberation by then. So she brought them back out, read them their duties as a jury, and then sent them back in to deliberate. And I would say at about 7.15, they reach a verdict. They, the jury found Lazzarini not guilty. But then the prosecution has them go one by one and kind of say, "Do you, it, was this your verdict and is this still your verdict? And that's a standard practice. Um, you know, defense or prosecution has a right to ask the judge to do that. So they go one by one. Um, each juror says, yes, this was my verdict. It still is my verdict. But, and and that was that. The, the trial appeared over, jurors are walking out, and prosecution realizes, wait a minute, you missed a juror. You didn't get everyone. So the jury comes back out, sits down, and they go one by one again. And one juror said no. She said, no, this is not my verdict. I think he's guilty. And you can just hear... Holland's family gasp. Um, at that point, they were very emotional from the not guilty verdict. And they there was audible gasps in the courtroom when that juror said that. And everyone starts looking at each other, <laughs> saying, just wondering what happens next. So when that happens, um, they have to go back in and del- deliberate. They have to reach a unanimous verdict. And so then they go in and deliberate. They don't come back out until eight o'clock. And at that point, that juror had changed their mind and decided Lazzarini was not guilty. And then that was the final verdict. So very tumultuous end to what was a already long trial. Um, But I think it, it really, I could see that it gave Holland's family a sliver of hope when that happened. Have we heard from William Holland's family or or anyone who knew him following the verdict? What's been their reaction to seeing Adam Lazzarini acquitted? So the entire time the trial went on, his family was very quiet. They haven't spoken to media ever since the incident happened. Just short uh, statements to the media, I would say, through their family a- attorney. We, uh, another reporter and I had asked the family attorney if he had comment, and his response was just, thank you for covering this trial. Really no word from his family since the verdict and since his death. Becky Buds with WLTX. Thanks for sharing the story. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening to this episode of The Daily Crime. We're right here with a new one every day of the week, Monday through Friday. So make sure you're subscribed to or following The Daily Crime wherever you're listening right now. If you're looking for more podcasts, you can head over to vaultstudios.com for a full list of our shows that includes our weekly podcast, True Crime Chronicles. That'll do it for this one. Until next time, for Vault Studios, I'm Reed Redmond.